thank you all for being here. I apologize for my voice. I've been teaching and lecturing for many weeks now, and I, you're getting the brunt of it, but I'm hopefully not gonna do most of the talking. I'm hoping that the panelists will be doing most of the talking. Um, so I've asked each of the panelists to introduce themselves uh, and talk about their work for about five minutes. Um, they each come from, they come to the music industry from different perspectives with different expertise. Uh, and I hope that will become apparent as they introduce themselves and what they study and work on. Uh, and then we've been talking about a series of questions to bat around mostly between the three of them and I will sort of shove maybe in different directions if, if necessary um, about music making and music distribution and music appreciation in the digital age and the age of the internet. Um, so with that, we're gonna start with, uh, Nancy. That's why I didn't start want to sit with Nancy, here. because she's to my right, uh, and she's the one I've known the longest. Well, Y'all noticed I tried to sit over there to get out of that spot. Um, hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, so I'm, I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research, which I'm just going to take a second and tell you what that means, because it's sort of a bizarre thing that Microsoft has, Microsoft Research, which is about 1,000 people worldwide. My lab in New England is about 20 permanent researchers, and basically we're the on-site academics. So we're all uh, taken from universities. We were all professors. We're all PhDs. And we're doing basic research. We're publishing in journals. We're going to academic conferences. We're being evaluated just like we would be were we faculty at Yale, um, which some of us have been and will be in the future, no doubt. Um, not me, personally, though. Um, <laughs> So prior to joining Microsoft, I was a communication professor, uh, a media studies scholar. I, believe it or not, uh, have been studying audiences online for 25 years now. Um, you can think about whether you remember the internet 25 years ago or not, but there were fans on there and they were really into music. Um, I've been looking at audiences and music online for about 10 years. The reason I'm interested in this, I love music, I'm a very passionate music fan. Uh, I paid for music just a few days ago, uh, and probably will a few days from now. Um, but my, my passion, what, what motivates me to look at this is that when these new technologies come along, whether they are musical notation or uh, broadcasting or recording or the internet, they provide moments that disrupt and cause us to reflect on the sort of social relationships and social arrangements that we've made. And with music, it tends to happen before it happens on a lot of other fronts. And you very much see this with the topic that we're going to be talking about today, because music was so tiny, it could be shared so easily. And when I say tiny, I mean the size of an MP3 file as opposed to the size of a Hollywood film, for instance. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I, that I look at. Um, so when I think about the question of IP, which is the topic today, intellectual property, I see intellectual property as one of, of a number of values that are circulating in the relationships between musicians and their audiences, which to me, aside from perhaps musicians and their other musicians with whom they're performing, is, is the core set of relationships that matter here. Um, how, are, how do those relationships um, get, and the relationships of the intermediaries in between, how do all of those get disrupted by technology and what does that tell us more broadly? We're in a, a historical moment, we're using the phrase the gig economy to talk about work much more broadly and of course gig as a term to describe work originates with jazz musicians, right? So there you have such a beautiful clear archetype of music being the predecessor for much broader trends in labor. Um, so there's a whole lot I could talk about about that, which I will not go on and on and on about. Um, but I think that the, the key thing is that on the one hand, we have cultural labor, cultural work, creative work being held up as sort of this ideal kind of work because you can follow your passion, you can express yourself, you can attain self-actualization, you can live a life of pleasure and fulfillment, and all that is supposed to be, right, every kid, I'm a parent of teens, they're all being told, find your passion and pursue your passion, right? Don't be a company man, it's all about your passion now. Uh, so that's the ideal, right? You get your passion, and what could be more passionate than music, right? And at the same time, all of the risk, all of the burdens, all of the precariousness, all of the 
millions of kinds of work that it takes to maintain that just multiply and multiply and multiply while all of the social frameworks that support us through all of these things fall away. Um, so that's the context in which I see IP as one piece of a, of a much larger set of issues. I'll stop there. Okay. Jean. So I get a little bit nervous when I speak, and I also have a lot to say about this topic, so I hope you'll forgive me in that I wrote out my opening remarks. Um, some of the things that I've written down are kind of funny when you look at it, because I know what my name is, but I still wrote that part down too. <laughs> so, so my name is Jean Cook. I've played the violin since I was three years old. Um, over the last 22 years, I've played on more than 80 records, including two Grammy nominations, and also toured over 800 dates over four continents, mostly with rock bands, but also with jazz ensembles and new music ensembles as well. I've also worked as a performing arts presenter and a radio producer producer and also a concert producer. For over a decade, I was on staff with Future of Music Coalition. It's a nonprofit that helps to bring musicians' voices to the table when policy decisions are made that impact the ability for them to make a living. That's me testifying in front of the New York City Council about why artists think that it's important that people like Comcast and Time Warner don't become the new content gatekeepers of the internet. In 2015, FMC got in a big fight with the New York Times Magazine about a cover story about creative careers and how they had been disrupted by technology. So not only had the New York Times misinterpreted data to fit a convenient narrative about how technology lifted all boats, but they also neglected to seriously examine what was harder for creators now or what hadn't changed at all. So after a series of public letters back and forth between us and the writer, uh, we also saw other artist groups weighing in. That's Maria's group there. And then also other journalists as well taking a look at the subject. Then some researchers started to get involved and it kept going and going until we weren't fighting anymore. At the end of the fight, while we were all very clear about where the writer had made particular mistakes, we weren't very clear about how musicians were actually faring. I don't really blame the writer for the kinds of mistakes that he made because it's a very difficult question to answer. And this is actually a question that FMC has been struggling with for many years. Um, so I ran the Artist Revenue Streams Project for Future of Music Coalition, which has gathered the, and analyzed the largest qualitative and quantitative data set about how US musicians make money. So this had never been done before. And so previously, when policymakers wanted to understand how artists were doing, since there was no data, they would try and find compelling anecdotes to justify the decisions that they would make. So we didn't think that only charismatic personalities and dramatic stories should dominate the debate about how new business models and changes in copyright law are impacting artists. We think you know, storytelling is a critical tool and it's, it's a way to communicate ideas, but we believe that actual data has an important role as well. But good data is very hard to find. The data gap wasn't just impacting policymakers. We saw that journalists were confused by it as well. I once had an astonishing conversation with a well-respected journalist at a newspaper of record who once patiently explained to me that he thought that there were fewer musicians making a living from classical music than from indie rock in the United States. And so I said to him, I said, that's fascinating. You're really in a position to see all the studies and really understand the data. You know, what are you kind of basing this uh, pronouncement on? And he said, it's... Um, it's a gut feeling that I have. Um, as far as I can tell, this person has very little experience with the classical music genre, so I'm not sure that he knows that symphony orchestras have musicians on salary. I mean, not like a full-time salary, but they do have a salary um, that most symphony players also have teaching jobs. His view of the industry doesn't appear to be particularly shaped by understanding the diversity of the musician experience. And he's not alone. So um, this is what it looks like in my head when I think about the money generated uh, by a musician. So, oh, and they, they gave me a pointer. 
Um, so in the corners, um, you can see the different kinds of fans. And then you can also see the money as it winds its way through the various intermediaries and eventually end up in the musician's bank account. So this is a really important point. So the money that's generated by the musician's activity is kind of like this whole thing. And then the money that actually ends up in the musician's bank account is that thing. Does that make sense? OK. So that's actually something that musicians don't really get very confused about. They know how much they make versus how much they generate. But journalists and services, music services like Spotify or YouTube, and policymakers, they confuse those two things all the time. So because of the gap in perspective, musicians sometimes, unfortunately, you know, I get very sad about this, they come off as kind of cranky scolds. You know, they'll, they'll get in the press and they'll talk about, well, that's not actually how things are true. And that, I think that's an unfortunate. Uh, sometimes musicians even get painted as the enemies of their fans. And that's uh, almost always never true. The opposite of that is true. So what I love about our research is that it allows for us to talk about the diversity of the music industry and musicians' complicated lives in a data-driven way. Like, for example, what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? It's not just an attitude or a great idea or a product or a platform. It's also about weaving a career together from many different roles you play as an artist. So this level of complexity and nuance is often missing from debates about music careers, and we think that leads to a poor understanding of what musicians actually need. I wanted to touch for a moment on what I think is one of the most difficult challenges for musician compensation and attribution in the digital space, and then I'm going to conclude. Um, and so this is about ensuring that the information and the money flows don't just work in the biggest pipes, the pipes between the major labels and the music services. It also needs to work downstream through the smaller pipes, the narrower pipes, and down to the last mile, where marginalized artist communities and music are served by the system. So this is the place where the classical musicians live, the jazz musicians live, background musicians and independent artists who don't have support. So that's one of the reasons why Future Music is focused for so long on transparency. Our approach is research, then education, then advocacy. We think encouraging more transparency in the system and explaining how things work, whether it's who's at the table when Spotify royalties are calculated, or how the money flows in the music industry, um, or mapping out the royalty and metadata chains, or what legislation it's actually moving, that these investigations will provide musicians and advocates with the tools that they need to seek better solutions that work for everyone. That's me. Uh, Maria. Uh, so I'm a jazz composer, band leader. I, I, let's see, starting in about, well, my first eight years in New York, I moved to New York in 1985. My first eight years I made a living as a music copyist. Um, and then I finally started to make money as a composer. In that period of time when I was a copyist, I had the great fortune to work with Gil Evans and um, studied with Bob Brookmeyer and various really great people, and I was writing, always writing in my off time. Oh, sorry, Marie, can you explain what a copyist is? Oh, a music copyist, um, so n now everything's computerized, but in the, when a composer writes out a score with all the parts of the instruments, somebody has to copy those individual parts for her to play violin and for somebody else to play bassoon. And so we would sit at desks in midtown Manhattan with pen and ink, you know, and little inkwell, you know, kind of pens. It was like monks in there. And it, it was a pretty interesting way to make a living. Um, and so at night I was writing like crazy, and I had wanted and um, started a band, a big band. And I had wanted to record, but all the record companies said, oh, you know, we like your music, but we don't know how to market you because you're not playing. I was conducting. and. Um, your composer with a big band is just, I don't, we just don't know what to do with that. So I decided, and it, this has kind of been my MO ever since, um, to invest in myself. So I saved up $30,000 and I recorded the band. And then I had this DAT tape and went around and tried to sell it. And again, we don't know how to market you. Well, I went to Europe and finally a record label named uh, called Enja Records, um, picked it up in Germany. And they said that they would buy this um, $30,000 recording for $10,000. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and and um, believe me, but I was happy. I was really happy because it was a because and this is a thing for musicians because it was a label that I admired. And I admired, so I was willing, this is an interesting thing to understand how musicians work. And I remember speaking with my lawyer at the time, don't get in the way of this deal. I really want this deal. I need this. I need this. I want this exposure. This is my opportunity, you know, and, and, and this kind of, I don't want to call it ego attachment to that label name, but that need for that label to represent me which meant much more back then than it means now. In the old days, going into a record store and seeing you know, Sony or, or Blue Note on a record really meant something. Now it's like you buy something on iTunes, you don't even really maybe know who it is. So, um, so let's see, so they bought it for 10,000 and I had to give up a portion of my publishing, percentage of my performing royalties, a percentage of my mechanical royalties, and that they would administer. I really honestly didn't even really know what that meant and didn't even really care. I was like, oh, I'm never going to make any royalties, you know, whatever. Well, um, the, I, I got a lawyer and the deal was negotiated. So then the record did very well. It sold over 20,000 CDs at the time. Um, and so right, and that for big band was really huge, you know. So. So then the um, second record came, and I, by the way, I wasn't making any money. I never really thought about the fact that it's so, it was selling like 20000 almost right off the bat, and I didn't make anything, because if they're selling it for, you know, five, six dollars a CD, wow, you know, 20000 of those puppies. Isn't that like 100000 Shouldn't I be making something? But I, you know, it was like I'd get these statements with these numbers that I didn't understand. Recoupment, I don't know, what's that? Whatever. You know, so then um, they paid for my next record. Then my third record, the record started to get really expensive. So the third record was going to be $60,000. And they said, well, we can't, um, we can't pay that. We, we, will, we have a budget of 40000 and that's it. And I said, okay, how about if I pay 20,000 of it, and, but then we go in on a split that I get a third of it and we recoup simultaneously. And it seemed that that was gonna be a good deal. So I was like, okay, we're gonna go for that. We still did the same publishing deal where they had part of my publishing. So this is around, this came out in the year 2000. So the record came out, did very well, um, and immediately, and immediately a company, Koch, was licensing it in the United States, and you know, so I, the mechanicals and everything um, should be rolling in. Well, I get my statement, and it's this recoupment thing, and the numbers aren't making sense, and there's no check, and there's no, wi <laughs> there's no wiring, and I'm like, wait, okay, so what does this mean? And I was really confused, so I called them, and I said, I don't understand this, and, and I happened to be sitting there with a friend of mine, his name was Brian Camillo, and I, I couldn't breathe because I had gone seriously into hock for this $20,000, and I was counting based on my last numbers that, you know, okay, this is a different kind of deal. Well, it turned out that the lawyer missed something that I would be paid upon recoupment of their recording expenses. At that point, I understood something I never understood before, and that is how the record companies calculate recoupment. They calculate recoupment at the artist's royalty rate. So that means, and I think my royalty rate was probably something like 12% or something like that, which was actually pretty high. But, you know, so I'm, I'm going to um, describe what I mean. Um, so let's imagine that a record company is selling the record, so the record company sells to the distributor, the distributor sells to the record store, the record store sells to, you know, the, the person who buys the record. So there's all these people taking the money along the way. So at the first level, let's say after paying the mechanical royalty, they're making $5 a CD. Okay, um, let's imagine the budget was $20,000. So you would imagine if, and let's say I got a crazy royalty of 20%. We'll do it just so it's easy. So it would be, if it's $5, that means $1. I, I get a royalty of $1, right? So if the contract says that um, upon recoupment of record, recording expenses, I get paid my first dollar, you would think if they're making $5 a CD and the budget is $20,000, 
$20,000, they have to sell $4,000, and then I get a dollar, right? But what I learned in that moment was that they calculate recoupment at the artist royalty rate. So that means they're calculating if I was getting a dollar CD royalty, which nobody would, that's way too high a royalty, but we're doing this to make math easy. One dollar, that means in order to get to $20,000, if they're calculating at my royalty rate, that means they have to sell 20,000 CDs before I get my first dollar, right? Because if my royalty rate was a dollar, they, they, so that means they made 100,000 minus the 20 that they spent on the record. Now they've made an $80,000 profit and now I get a dollar. And this is something I never understood. And I said, well, that's absolutely crazy. And I thought that's absolutely immoral. Now, something I'm gonna tell you is with the way the business is now, it actually doesn't feel that immoral to me anymore because it's gotten so completely immoral that that actually seems like a good deal. Because I'll tell you what the record companies were doing back then that many of them are not doing now. They were investing in the artist. They're, for every artist that makes a lot of money, many lose money, right? So if 10 artists are losing money but I'm making money, they need that to pay for those artists to make that investment. I, I'm not crying alligator tears or what do they say, whatever for record companies, but, but that's the thing I learned. So at this point, is how many minutes do I have before five are off? You're, you're over, but finish it up. Okay, so I'll wind it up. Okay. That, and, and, and I will talk about this as we go on. That was the aha moment that changed my life because, and in a big way, and changed this guy, Brian Camilio, because that moment made him get the idea for creating something called Artist Share which is how I fund my records now. And it's all about self-ownership, complete transparency, owning all my data. And it has enabled me to make $200,000 recordings now and pay for them. So that's what, that's just the background of how I got there. Okay, that's a very good punchline. All right, so one of the things that we um, have been talking about offline um, and that I think about a lot in my teaching and my research is the promise of the digital age is that it brings democracy and democratization to everyday life. That's one of the things that we've been thinking about, the digital revolution across all fields. Um, it, uh, it provides opportunities for the smallest people and the biggest organizations. And it has this promise of redistribution. That is the sense that the internet age has. And yet, one of the things that we continually see and are now thinking a lot about um, is how only 15 or 20 years in, we are seeing the reproduction of power imbalances, um, age-old inequities, and, um, and, and wealth distributions that remind us of what happened, what was, what it was like 50 or 100 years ago. That is, there's not a lot of change actually going on when you start measuring where the money is going. Um, although we talk about it a lot, that is, um, th that is a concern that we have. So the, one of the questions that I um, asked of these uh, three very, um, very knowledgeable human beings about, the, about music is, as the digital technology and our life in the digital age has evolved, um, what aspects of this re revolution do you most embrace in this field and which are the ones that you most are anxious about and fight? So which are the, what are the upsides that you are holding onto and want to cultivate and what are the things um, that you're pushing against? So that was one of the first uh, points of departure. And um, I'll start with Jean. Okay. Um, so I think that when FMC first started, this was in 2000, that was when Napster started, I guess. Um, the big phrase that everybody was trying to understand was disintermediation. The idea that between you and the fan was no longer a big box store and a major label and a big you know, radio station that you had to go through the label to get to. And, and that was the only way that you could reach fans. The idea that you could get on the internet and you can find your fans all by yourself was great. I mean, we think that that opened the doors theoretically for so many people. When you say that there, uh, 
wasn't necessarily a redistribution of wealth and that we're seeing a lot of the same power players still have the power. Um, I think that's true, but at the same time, you know, 15 years seems like a long time, but a lot of the infrastructure for our industry still hasn't been completely built. Like just as a simple example, I don't know if any of you are classical or jazz music fans and have ever tried to shop for that music on any music service. Um, I have a presentation from 2013, 10 years after the launch of iTunes, where they still were getting the composers and the performers confused and they're still trying to tell you that the track name was Allegro, which could mean all kinds of things. Um, and that was 10 years into the digital space. Thankfully, uh, I was actually just doing a panel about that topic last week. I went and looked up all of the examples that I had from all the services, and they have made progress, and they have addressed some of the most egregious and embarrassing issues. But that's on the consumer-facing side. That's on the side everybody sees and can point to and say, oh my god, I can't believe you're there. The back end that nobody sees, especially not the artists, it's still really being built out. And so that's a significant piece of work that needs to be done and we'll need a lot of, you know, we need a lot of help to do that. But that's, it's interesting because it's hard to get the focus on the infrastructure because a lot of people don't realize that the infrastructure simply doesn't exist yet in a lot of places. So Maria, what aspects of this revolution do you most embrace and what do you most fight? Well, so the thing that Brian, um, Camilio came up with not long after that. He said to me, what's the one thing that nobody can file share? Because Napster was happening at that time. And I said, I don't know, Brian. And he said, the creative process. I'm going to create a platform where you can announce you're making a project, connect directly with your fans, and um, share along the way that they can participate, pre-order, whatever. And you can share video from, you know, talking about the writing of your music or the rehearsing interviews with players in my band. And we talked about numbers. Suddenly he was going to give me 85% of gross. So if I, we started doing the numbers. If I sell a CD for $18 and I'm making 85% and all these middlemen are gone, all of a sudden we're doing the numbers. I'm like, okay, 10,000 of those ka -ching, that's $150,000 or something like that. So, you know, so then we started talking about how I can market to um, different people, like a composer. I could create something about composing my music where they get scores. What can I sell that for? Well, you know, $35, $65, scores for $115, I don't know. You know, suddenly I'm setting my own price. I'm connecting directly with my fans, and I can see exactly who they are the moment they buy. So it was such a mind-blowing liberation for me. It worked so insanely well, and the fans loved it. And, and in 2003, I was the first artist to win a Grammy only selling on the internet, because the other thing Brian said to me is, let's take it out of the record stores. Tower is going south anyway. And he said, those are all anonymous sales. If you sell through your website and start training your fans, you're going to know who every fan is. So when you make the next record, you can write to them. I was like, hello, this is so fantastic. And I kept thinking, I wonder what's going to, when is it going to happen that all these people, all these record companies and stuff, all these people that were just so um, greedy all those years, how are they going to find a way to take advantage and ruin this fun, you know? <laughs> Because I just love this so much. And then one day, you know, somebody said, hey, check out YouTube. And I was like, and I was like, well, wait a minute. How, how did they get this video? And this, where's the copyright? Oh, you know, and people are like, oh, no, but it's really cool. And I'm like, wait, but what about the copyright, you know? And then that's where, for me, I think that's where it started, where everybody starts getting mesmerized by this idea that everything is available and everything's free and isn't it wonderful to have access to everything and and this mentality started where they started saying to get the eyeballs and everything oh this is good for the artists you should be on YouTube put your music up you're gonna get fans it's all social media well nobody was saying to people this is 
watering you down. This is completely diluting you. And every, if everybody gets everything for free, nobody's going to want to pay for it anymore. So, and that's a subject we can go on for weeks about. So I'll. No, it's definitely two sides of a similar. Uh, it's the same coin on different sides. Um, Nancy, so uh, most embrace, most fight. I. Okay, so I'm going to approach this as a, as a music listener and as, as somebody speaking on behalf of audiences. Um, that ubiquity and access to music is enormous. And certainly music listeners really appreciate that in this moment. You raised history earlier. You know, that was one of the great things about recording also was like, whoa, I can have music at home whenever I want it. I can turn on the radio and there's music. This is amazing. It was for music listeners, an extraordinarily wonderful moment of access to music at the same time that for musicians it meant things like playing for a movie, a silent film, all those jobs were gone overnight, right? So the desire of audiences to have access to music and the joy of having access to music is not always um, compatible with the interests of musicians who want to make money from that music. So that's an, that's an old tension. But as a listener, I think it's hard to argue with being able to go to the internet. It doesn't even have to be YouTube, right? You just go to that box and put in Maria Schneider Orchestra, and oh, I can hear what she sounds like, right? And you, that may not be what you want at all, but as a listener, it might be fantastic, right? So I'm somebody whose musical tastes are not always confined by territorial licenses. Also, I really, really like Scandinavian music for whatever reason. Um, many of the artists that I listen to most never had any kind of distribution deals in the United States, and so the internet made it possible for me to discover whole music scenes that I didn't know existed and, and whole kinds of, well, not genres, but, but whole scenes that I, that I was unaware of. Um, I also then really appreciate the way that um, a service like Spotify thinks that I'm Swedish um, <laughs> and knows that I don't care if lyrics are in English um, so long as it has sounds that I like. And so it will algorithmically generate on my Monday discovery playlist. It will pull out some French recording artist from 1983 that has a song it thinks I'll like. And by God, I do. Right. So as a listener, those are, those are really wonderful things. And that direct access that you're talking about, I've had so many just thrilling moments of like, just the other day, Peter Bjorn and John put out a new album. I'm just gushing. So, so I just tweeted, I said, new Peter Bjorn and John, new Peter Bjorn and John, new Peter Bjorn and John. And I at Peter Bjorn and John each time. And like three minutes later, they like smiled back at me. And you know, I'm like a grown up, but I'm still like mm, you know, having a happy fangirl moment. And I think that's, that's really important. What do I dislike about it? Then I have to sort of step over to the other side of the fence. On the one hand, as a listener, that gate, the uh, lack of curation is, is kind of a problem. And the idea that algorithms are better than human curators, I find challenging. Um, but I, I worry more about much as I love the disintermediation and the, I can access my fans directly and I see who bought my stuff and I can write to them and it's awesome, I really worry about the way that that kind of engaging with our customers, with our readers, with our listeners, with our clients, with our consumers, with our whatevers is becoming a perfunctory part of earning a living. So this goes back to the gig economy piece, the way in which that kind of, I'm, I call it relational labor in the book I'm, I'm writing now, that kind of labor of cultivating these relationships and uh, sharing like Twitter's guidelines for uh, musicians to you make the best use of Twitter, talk about you can have an authentic relationship with your audience, right? So. Not everybody wants to have an authentic relationship with 1,000 people, 20,000 people, 30,000. You know, some of us don't even want to have authentic relationships with ourselves, right? <laughs> um, so I worry about that sort of creeping incendiary pressure for all of us to be courting people who we might want to do business with one day and keeping them in our loop and making sure they feel connected and think of me as a real person who needs to earn a living. And I worry about that whole layer of all of that beautiful social bonding that holds us together as civil societies becoming yet another thing we're keeping an eye on so we can monetize, 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 right? So that's, that's what scares that's me. That's so here. interesting. Um, 
I have so many questions, but I'm hoping you'll all fill in, fill in for me. Uh, one of the things about intellectual property that is deeply misaligned with everyday artists and inventors is that it doesn't protect hard work. Intellectual property as a legal mechanism protects, doesn't matter how hard you worked, it doesn't matter whether you created this amazing thing in a minute or 10 years, you get the same kind of protection no matter what. It doesn't matter whether you made it with 15 people or you made it all by yourself. Intellectual property is very flat that way. Um, and it, it, it was developed to be flat in many ways in a, in a theory of the everyday inventor and the everyday creator. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a genius. Um, anyone can be a copyright holder and anyone can be an inventor. The problem with that though is that when you work really, really hard at something, and it's not protected by intellectual property or it's only protected slightly by intellectual property, there's a lot of anxiety and, um, and, and distrust for the system that is supposed to help you continue to do your work. And what I mean is make work, that is make the things that people value, the music and the art, and to work to sustain yourself as an artist, to be a working artist. Um, so, Intellectual property doesn't actually fit very well with that model, but what you're hearing from the three of, of these folks is that everyday work sustaining communities of people who do this is really, really important. Because people want to maintain the music communities for audiences, for musicians. Um, and so my next question, or the question we talked about, is who are your new partners? Who are the people that you work with? And how have those partnerships, institutions, individuals, platforms, how have they changed in the digital age? Do you have new partners? Do you have old partners? Do you wish you had the same partners from, from 15 years ago? So it's a, it's a question about human and institutional partnerships in your everyday work. Um, how, have, how has that evolved for you? You want to start, Maria? Well, um, so like I was saying, most my work now is very direct to fan, um, which thank God I have that because I could never um, pay for my records. Otherwise, there's just no way I would be able to have the budgets. And even, even as it is, sometimes I don't make it. I made a classical record with two orchestras and it was $200,000 to make and I haven't made my money back. But you know, it was worth it for the investment. Um, but you know, there are all sorts of services and things that I use. I depend on ASCAP. Um, you're talking about services well, like... The, fir the first answer to my question sounded like the fans are your partners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's they what are. it sounded they like are. to me. They are, and uh, Artishare just it, it enables me this, this conduit to organize this thing. And, but yeah, I would say they are, and, and now it's gone so far as a lot of um, my commissions are direct to fans. Of my commission. So I, on my record, you know, there's my last record. I think three of the pieces, or maybe four, were commissioned by individuals through my website. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's a a huge thing for me. And it's unfortunately, I mean, it's just become really hard to do it another way because I think because copyright has been so eroded. By design, I mean, I, I had the opportunity to to um, testify before Congress, and about the DMCA, which is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This was design. This was an act that was created in 1998, and it basically gave safe harbor to big ISP companies that were like pipelines for all the digital information coming through, and they said. Companies like Verizon, AOL, you said, we, we don't know what's coming through our pipelines. We can't be held liable for, for what's coming through these pipelines. You know, we're, we're, we, we don't know what's there. And so, you know, the government said, okay, you get safe harbor. And then companies were told, as long as if there's a copyright holder whose work is being infringed, can write to you, and then you make sure it's taken down, you can have this safe harbor. So all, but what's happened in the meantime is all these companies that profess to be partners in music, like YouTube, for instance, they, they get safe harbor, even though they instigate 
co copyright infringement because that's how they make their money. They're making, they, they are a big data company. They're not in the music entertainment business. They're in the business of amassing data. <coughs> and, and Google now owns them, but when, before Google bought them, um, Google said, we don't want to buy them. These are rogue enablers of content theft. That was their quote. But then they went ahead and bought them. So, so if you, if if you want to put my music up on YouTube, YouTube doesn't ask you any question. They don't ask you if you own it. They don't ask you, jack diddly squat. You put it up, it's up to me to take it down. And then the next day, somebody else can put it up. And then I got to take it down again. And I've talked to people that have literally had to do thousands of takedown notices on one book or one song. And it's just absurd. So, you know, the, the biggest difficulty for an artist these days is keeping up, you know, policing the internet. It's like you think it's hard to keep up with engaging all those fans. Try to keep up with looking all over the internet. Every day people are writing to me, oh my God, look at, you know, your record's up here, this, your, your scores are up here, all your videos are up there. And, and some of them you can't even take it down because they're torrent sites. And so when you write to the company, they say, oh, it's not on our server. We have no, you know, yet they're protected by the DMCA. Or how do you protect yourself against that Russian company that is putting your music up? Google's giving a link to it, but you can't, you can't take it down. Now, you can file a takedown notice with Google, and if enough people do it, maybe they won't link to that site anymore, maybe. But in order to do that takedown notice, you know what you have to do? You have to sign on to Google's terms and conditions, which include limited liability and going to taking them to court where they want to go to court. So, you know, so all these things that are supposed to be good for the artists, are supposed to enable us to do things, have really brought us to our knees. And the, to me, the biggest problem is because the whole industry basically fell to their knees, just crumbled, um, it, it caused big record companies who are usually looking for short-term profits, you know, there aren't many big corporations that are thinking long-term, and so they aren't really thinking about sustainability, and that kind of instigated these record companies making really big deals with companies like Spotify and taking equity in a, in a big data company that's in the business of making music free for eyeballs and data. So now Sony, Universal, Warner, these companies that are supposedly representing musicians and supposedly a partner of us, suddenly they're in the business of big data making our music as cheap as possible so that their equity goes up. It's not quite that simple, but that's part of it. So it's, it's become really difficult to figure out who your true partners are in this yeah. business. Well, that, that's always been true, I think. As a lawyer, I was a litigator for a long time before I was a law professor, and I was always skeptical of the word partner in general, but um, that's why I'm asking the question. Jean, maybe have, to respond or your I own thoughts. I have a thoughts. brief comment to respond to Maria's statements, and then I also have an, my own yeah. response to your question. Um, it's really interesting when you're looking at partnerships and who could be a partner for you. And like kind of similarly to in real life, it also helps to understand where their past relationships were, to understand how they're treating you now. And that for a lot of services that are out there, their first, they, their first experience with the music industry, unfortunately, was the major record labels. And the major record labels those are copyright aggregators that are interested in bringing out the biggest amount of money that they can from the copyrights that they hold. Um, they're very short-term oriented. They're very much about just getting as much money as they can. And they're not necessarily interested in supporting a thriving culture. Um, they're not necessarily interested in the musician perspective. I'm sure, as you guys are probably all aware, their contracts are famously exploitative. Um, and there are many, many, many examples of places where they've done super terrible, terrible things. We don't have to talk about that here, but I did want to kind of point out that as much as we hoped that 
that dynamic of them having such a stranglehold on the industry would go away. And it is true that they don't have quite the leverage, that they didn't have quite the lock on the industry that they did before the internet. But my observation is that they're not really going without a fight. And so you see all kinds of actions that are happening that have these repercussions. And there are these waves that you see through the industry Anything that doesn't make sense in the music industry can usually be tied to something that happened with respect to the major record labels at some point down the line. So, I mean, I totally agree with a lot of the points that Maria's making, and I wanted to add to that, that the major labels are definitely not helping this environment, and I don't think that they will ever really be a very positive contributor um, to a great future for musicians online. Now, respect, with respect to your question about new partnerships, I come at this with a very specific perspective, which is that I come from the classical and the jazz communities. And what I've seen over the last uh, decade with FMC, kind of looking at how they interact in this digital marketplace, is that what's becoming apparent to me is that there is a need for kind of um, collaboration across genre divides. And you wouldn't think that genre divides were such a deep chasm, but I've been learning a lot about how, you know, for those of you who remember Tower Records, classical music was a different part of the store. The people who write about music, classical music, and even jazz are different than the people who cover the music industry. They have, a, they have specialists who do that kind of work. There's an isolation that kind of happened naturally, I guess, that once we all went online and everything was kind of dictated by the biggest players, classical and jazz kind of fell behind a little bit in terms of their infrastructure. Um, you know, that kind of relates to the thing I was saying earlier about how you couldn't really find music on iTunes for a really long time as a result. They're 3% of the marketplace. I don't remember if it's three each or three total. I think it's three each, so 6% of the marketplace. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with music services that would be like, oh, you know, I guess we are really deserving that part of the marketplace and we really should try and fix that and they'll put it on a to-do list or something. But the thing is, is that the way a lot of services work is they're triaging. They're constantly in crisis. They're dealing with trying to stay alive with all these competitors and all these problems. And the things that are good to do always stay on the to-do list. And they just kind of like get pushed back a couple years later, maybe 15 years later, iTunes finally finally gets the stuff right. And so this is a kind of environment where it's actually, it, it, it's actually the responsibility, in some cases, of the classical community or the jazz community or the individual, kind of like the background musicians or whoever it is that tends to be marginalized. They actually have to do work to step up and build some bridges for conversations. Because at the end of the day, you know, the Philadelphia Orchestra tried having their own store. It didn't work for very long. Ariyama, which was Sony's effort to have a classical only store, also didn't last very long. At the end of the day, I personally believe, as somebody who's been cultivating audiences as a presenter and as a producer of music, that the future of classical music really is in the hands of people who like music. So being not invisible on iTunes and being not invisible on Spotify and not invisible in the coverage of the industry, I think, is a critical piece. So partnerships that I think weren't necessary before the digital space that I think are necessary now for the future of these fields are about kind of figuring out like what is the digital data exchange and why do I need to learn about standards and what is metadata? These are conversations that as soon as classical and jazz are able to make headway in those areas, the really unsexy and weird areas of the music business, it's like this is like the asterisk areas, the parts that nobody reads about and nobody understands, I think that that will have a huge impact on the visibility of these genres in these communities. Super interesting. All right, Nancy, and then we'll open it up to questions. I have lots more, but I want to hear from you. 
new partnerships? Yeah. So again, thinking th th thinking in terms of in terms of the audience. Um, one of the enormous transformations that the internet has brought about for music audiences is that we can find each other so easily and the aggregate effect of a community of fans who have organized around an artist or around a genre can be much more significant than it could have been before when we were isolated in our towns and we knew the people who showed up at the concert hall with us but not the people who were showing up at the concert hall in all those other towns also. And now we might be there the next day going, oh, did she perform that song? That was really interesting. I love the whatever. And, and we're getting into it now. And I think that, that partnership amongst the audience members is really important for members of the audience. I think you can see that kind of model of fandom beginning to have a lot of consequences outside of, um, outside of entertainment in ways that are both positive and negative. We're certainly seeing fandom in politics right now. I would say this whole election is in large part about competing fandoms. Um, at the same time, that, that partnership, I hope, and in the ideal becomes one that works with the artist, where the artist is, is working with that community as a community rather than solely as a market. And what I love listening to you talk about your fans funding you is that you don't talk about them as it's great, they're a market, I can sell, I can monetize. You talk about them as people who love your music and who are inspired to help you create it and who motivate you to continue creating it. And I think that's the partnership to me that's really exciting here is the ability for fans to organize amongst themselves and to organize with the artist in ways that can help sustain that artist's productivity and hopefully owning a home and having college tuition for children and retirement money and not having to tour when you're old and your hips don't work anymore and things like that. Right, sustainable artistic communities is something that I hear a lot and how do you manage that? So we're out of time. I want to thank the panelists very much. Thank you.